Hi guys, today we're going to start an introduction to Photoshop and we're just going to take a look at what it looks like, just go over the overview, um, some of the basic tools and basic functions of Photoshop and of course as we progress into some of our other assignments we'll get more in detail on some of the other functions of Photoshop. But today it's just to serve as a sort of introductory uh, lesson just to get you a little bit familiar with what Photoshop is. Um, many of you may have uh, used Photoshop before. I'm sure you've all heard of Photoshop, um, but let's get started. So this is what you will see when Photoshop opens. Um, now, what Photoshop looks like and its entry screens can vary slightly from version to version. Um, however, even though um, Photoshop really gets updated, you know, pretty every year or so, uh, the functions of Photoshop have remained the same throughout the years. So if you want to go and buy an old, see if you can find an older version or something like that um, for your own personal use, go ahead. It works the same. There will be no functions that we will utilize that aren't available on older versions of Photoshop. So if you have an older version, feel free to use that. Um, if you don't have Photoshop, of course, um, go ahead and get connected to your remote desktop system, the VDI system, um, and you can access the school's computers remotely and utilize the software there. And that will be true for all of the softwares that we're using. So that might be your first thing. If you haven't done that already, go ahead and set up your remote desktop and you'll be ready to access a school computer that's fully furnished with all of the software that we're going to be using this semester. Okay, so this is the opening screen. It says, welcome to Photoshop. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's basically asking us right now what we want to do. Do we want to create a new document or do we want to open an existing document? Well, let's create a new one. So I'm going to create this and it's going to give us this window and it's going to give us some presets based on what we might want to be doing. Now up here, we have options to choose from. And depending on what we're creating and what it's intended for, uh, we can choose from these presets. Um, so if we're gonna be working on a printed photo or a photo or a print, um, it's gonna give us certain presets. So let's go to photo. Um, and you'll see it gives us sort of default image sizes that we'll typically see um, landscape ones, Photoshop size, and you'll also notice that they're slightly higher resolution. And we'll go over here and uh, look at all the sets uh, in a minute. Um, but typically what we're gonna see on, on documents that are intended for printing um, or for photo, uh, we're typically gonna see higher resolution than for web or mobile. Um, and this is because when you are creating an image for online use for a website or for mobile use or an app or something like that, um, the higher resolution images take longer to load. So if we pop on over here, we'll typically see it's 72 PPI, which is pixels per inch, whereas the print typically sets at a 300 PPI. Um, what we can also sometimes see is, uh, we're not seeing it change over here, but for printing and for photo and things like that, what we'll typically see is a CMYK color. Um, now, if you are going to be printing something from Photoshop, you do wanna use CMYK color. Now, CMYK color stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, I forget why K stands for black, but you can just Google it if you're interested. <clears throat> now, the reason um, we want to use CMYK color for things that are going to be printed and aren't for online use um, is because most printers have CMYK ink. Now, if you own a printer, you know this because you have to buy um, the cartridges that are the colors and you'll get cyan, magenta, yellow, or black ink. Now, things that are destined for screens um, are going to be RGB because screens are calibrated in RGB color. Um, so depending on where you intend this to go, and since most of our, or all of our work is just going to be emailed to, to me, um, you can go ahead and use RGB color. 
Now, there's other presets over here. So if you don't want to use one of the um, presets they already have for you, you can go and set your own distinctions. So here you can set the size of the document. So tabloid is your typical printer tabloid or legal is your typical sort of legal uh, letter is your typical letter size. Of course, this, since we're in the print section are giving us um, typical printer size uh, form formats. Um, web, of course, is gonna set it to web pages or different things like that. Um, and it's typically done in inches, not pixels. Um, uh, pixels, not inches, I'm sorry. Um, but of course, no matter what you want, if none of these are accurate for you or you just want to define uh, your document size, you can come over here and choose whatever um, unit of measurement you would like. So if you'd like inches or if you are from abroad, you wanna use centimeters, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and set whatever it is here. So say I want some like a five by five image of inches that would be, I could come here and simply set it. Five inches by five inches. Now you can also set the orientation, but since I've done a cube, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so either landscape or portrait, and here you can see the difference between the two. Now below here, you can set the resolution. Um, so you can do pixels per inch or pixels per centimeter if, again, you prefer metric. Um, we're going to be using uh, imperial, so anything that I specify is going to be pixels per inch, or um, if I specify a size for your document, um, it's going to be in inches. Um, but you can set the resolution, and the presets that they have are pretty good. Um, 72 pixels per inch is, is pretty much ideal for anything to be um, used on a web page or app or anything like that. Um, 300 is really good for printing. I wouldn't print anything below about 150 pixels per inch. Um, otherwise, it'll be a little grainy, just you won't have the best resolution. Um, you can also set your background color. We'll typically do white, so on and so forth. So let's get started. Um, I can keep my 72. This looks fine. We're just going to be kind of playing around so I don't have anything specifically set out and you can do whatever you like. Pick a preset or whatever. So let's create um, a file. So I'm going to create and now we're going to open up into our workspace and this is the Photoshop workspace. Now it looks a little complicated like there's a lot of stuff in here but don't worry um, because a lot of this stuff is redundant, a lot of this stuff is sort of specialty niche tools and applications um, that we're not going to really use for this course or you're not necessarily going to use in uh, the fashion industry. Uh, Photoshop is really powerful, it has a lot, a lot of different options. And we're going to look at just sort of some of the more basic functions of it. So now that we have our artboard, let's sort of take a look at the workspace here. Um, up here, let's start all the way up here is our main menu bar up here. And this is where you're going to find all the stuff that you're sort of used to seeing whenever you open any kind of application or program. Uh, your file, which is something you should be familiar with. Uh, when we open it, we see all the things that we normally see in a file menu, open, new, save, save as, things like that. Um, if you want to export as, a, as a, uh, another type of file, even in Save As, we have lots of different file types to choose from. Um, but if it's not there, you can go to Export and you'll typically find it there. Uh, we're not going to use this in Photoshop because all the file types we need will be found in the Save As window, but we will use this when we move on to Illustrator. Um, edit has all the stuff that we typically see in Edit, Undo, Redo, cup, Copy, Paste, so on and so forth. Now, I'm sort of glossing over a lot of these stuff here, but again, we're gonna go more into different details later on. I don't wanna overwhelm you when we start. So I'm gonna keep it pretty simple. Image has different image adjustments, and we're going to use a lot of these and go over a lot of them um, in our first project. Um, but this is where we're going to do sort of some basic image editing, uh, where you can adjust things like contrast, color, 
uh, the size of the image, the canvas size. So if you made a mistake opening up, um, you can go ahead and adjust them here. And I will go ahead and go into a little bit there since we are starting out. So um, one of the things that might be a little bit confusing when you start is the difference between image size and canvas size. Now, right now we don't have an image. We just have a blank, um, what is called canvas or artboard. So say I made an error in my document creation at the beginning and I wanna change it. Um, I can go to canvas size. So canvas size is going to allow me to change the size of my workable area. Now, um, any image that I open or put in this is got to conform to this size. This is the overall size of my image. Um, so again, if I wanna change it, I can change it here. So let's say I wanna make it bigger. Um, I can go ahead and I, maybe I wanna make it wider. So I'm gonna maybe change the width here. Now this is gonna show me down here where and how it's going to expand. So let's go ahead and make, I'm gonna make uh, a little bit different here. So um, if I, it's going to expand out evenly all the way around with this configuration. So the dot is really your image and the arrows are showing where it's gonna add your extra inches or your extra space. Now, if I want it just to expand upwards and outwards, I can drop the dot down here. That means it's not gonna make the bottom any bigger. It's just going to make it bigger around here. Same as if I drag the dot over here. Now it's just gonna expand it over here, uh, so on and so forth. So if you have a specific area in mind, and this is really, I mean, this is not gonna make too much difference right now because I don't have anything on my artboard, but if I, are, if I did, um, I might need the extra space relative to where my image and my work is currently. So that's where this would come in. It's showing you where it's gonna add this extra space. Let's put it back, I can um, uh, expand evenly out and just say okay, and we can watch it get a little bit. Um, oh, did I cancel? It changed it, okay, anyway. So, um, Oh, okay, it, it, <laughs> I didn't see that it changed it, but it did. It's now six, six inches um, and, and uh, uh, seven here. So, okay, I didn't even notice that it changed, but it did. Okay, so um, that goes into our canvas size. We also have image rotation. So if you open something that's not the right orientation, you can rotate the image in here. Um, now layers, I'm gonna get into layers a little bit later when we um, get into some of the basic tools, but the layer function is one of the core principles of using um, really most Adobe softwares, but also Photoshop. Um, so I'm gonna leave that off and uh, move on. Now type is going to relate to all the text that we use um, and we'll have our own um, little panels for this as well. So um, the type menu, I don't use that much. I usually use the panel, which again, we're gonna get into uh, more when we uh, utilize the type tools. Now select over here uh, will govern different things that you can do for all your selections. Now selecting parts of the image, um, again, is one of the core functions of Photoshop. Um, how we manipulate our images can really fall into just a few different categories. Uh, one would be sort of your basic image adjustments, which are handled over here, again, which are brightness levels, and selection, which is where you select certain parts of the image, and you can copy them, you can edit just those, um, or you can uh, move them around, and things like that. Um, and we have a lot of different tools to be able to make selections, and a lot of different um, utilities in the select menu to help us sort of manage and manipulate our selections. 
Um, and again, that's going to be something that we talk about a lot um, when I get to the tools. The filters are, um, I'll show you some of them. We're not going to really be using um, many uh, of them, but basically if you think about, you know, your Instagram filters or things like that, they don't have like the little dog face or anything like that, but um, it's the same idea. Uh, it's a, a sort of layer uh, application that we use to alter our images. We're not gonna be using anything in 3D, so you can just forget about it. Uh, view will um, have some very helpful things. Um, of course, you can zoom in here, and we also have a, uh, a few very helpful guides that help us create images and format them. Uh, so basically what's showing right now are our rulers, which are right up here. Um, we also, down here, have a few other things that can help us. Typically what I will do is sometimes use the grid option. Uh, now this can be very helpful when you want to do a lot of page formatting, when you're doing mood boards, or even when you're doing um, flats or things like that, um, because it gives you this sort of grid st structure. Now the grid structure is not going to show up in your final version. Um, it's just sort of there as a template but it helps you sort of align things and different things like that. And you can toggle the view off right here. And it also handles your guide. So we have a guideline and similar to the grid, we can use our uh, mouse. If we click on an arrow, click, hold down the mouse button and drag out, I can drag out guidelines that can help me align different elements of my image. Um, now I can drag them out pretty easily, but if I don't want to see them anymore, I go to view and then I click off on the glides and they'll disappear. I can toggle it back on so you can see uh, what it looks like without them um, or with them. Window is going to have a different, uh, a whole long list of panes. Now, we're not going to use a lot of these, so again, if it looks very overwhelming, um, we're only going to use a few of these different panes. Now, the panes will um, manage and allow different options uh, for different tools and um, aspects of Photoshop. So, if you're looking for something and you can't find it, um, especially, you know, if you're following along in a lesson and, you know, we're going to a, uh, a different panel or a different pane, um, you can find them here if they're not popping up. Now, some of them will automatically open. They're over here. So things like color is color. So this guy right here is the same as going to here. And you can see now that it is open because it is checked if I want to close it. I can shrink it back. And we have a lot of these different panes that will help us, again, um, determine certain properties of the image, tools that we're working with, text, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, last but not least, or very indeed least, help, because I don't know, I've never found it very helpful. <laughs> if not, just email me. Uh, okay, so let's move on. That is your basic menu up here. Now we're going to get down to the tools. Our next bar here is showing us um, basically what's called tool preferences. So as I click through the different tools, the tools are over here. And these are what we use to actually make selections, edit the, edit, um, the image, so on and so forth. And as I go to every tool, you can see that that tool preference bar changes with the tool because every tool has its own preference. So as we go through each tool, I'll go over its preferences um, and you know options up here uh, so that they make sense. Um, here, of course, is your actual work area. And over here is our panes. Um, and of course, we can pop them in and pop them out as need be. Layers, again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so that's our basic space. Um, so let's get into actually what Photoshop does. And to do that, we need an image. So I'm gonna just pull up an image. I have some lovely flowers loaded. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to find one, and this is a lovely begonia, so why don't we use this? And to get it into Photoshop, there's lots of ways to get it into Photoshop. You can always save a file and open that file directly into Photoshop, and uh, we'll take a look at that when we do our first project. But just to mess around, I'm going to right click on this image, go to copy image, pop on over to Photoshop, and then paste it in. Now I use the shortcut for paste, which is control V. And I'm gonna go over a lot of keyboard shortcuts because Photoshop has a lot and they're very useful um, to shorten the time and make it a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> just since we're on the subject, Photoshop uses probably all the key commands that you're familiar with. So again, I just use control V for paste. You're probably familiar with that. Um, control C for copy, uh, control X for undo, or control X for um, cut, uh, control Z for undo, so on and so forth. Now, as you can notice, um, I only have a very small bit of my begonia showing. This is because, let me just pop back, um, if you see the resolution here, this is a very large high-res image. So when I created this um, artboard, it was a very low res and smaller area. Um, so it is only taking, uh, only showing a small portion of this much larger image. So let's go to one of our first and most valuable tools to know, and this is our move tool. So um, another nice feature about the newer versions of Photoshop is if you just hover your mouse over a tool, it will give you a brief sort of visual summary of what the tool is and what it does. So the move tool and that little V that's there um, is the keyboard shortcut, which means if I hit the V on the keyboard, the tool will automatically pop up. Let me show you. There we go, now I have my move tool. Um, and each tool has this. So it's a nice little way to not have to remember exactly the icon for every tool. And it also, again, gives you a little bit of a hint on what the tool does. Obviously, it's, it's again, a summary. Oh, how appropriate for us, right? It says there's in a tape measure. Um, so again, it's, it's sort of brief summary, um, makes it a little bit easier for us to go through and understand what each tool does. Okay, so, so now that we are on um, the move tool, what I want to do is I can move the image around, obviously, for the move tool, but I can also scale the image. Now, to be able to scale an image, I have to have this preset clicked. Now, um, most versions will not have it clicked. You see the, that, um, sort of border goes away. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't automatically click this because it's <laughs> always pretty necessary to be able to scale your images. Um, but know this and, and please, please, please remember this um, because this is where I, it's kind of hidden up here and will frustrate you if you can't scale your images. And um, this is like the number one question. Why can't I scale the images? Did you click your show transform controls? Um, so go ahead, do that. Now, when they are clicked, you can see I get this bounding box and I can grab uh, the corners, these boxes, uh, by clicking and holding the mouse button down and shrinking them. Now, um, as I'm shrinking, it will constrain the proportions of the image. That means it won't make it any skinnier. It won't make it any fatter. If I want to resize my image in a way where it is skinnier or fatter, I have to go ahead and hold the shift key. As you can see, I still have my image here and it is still the same proportions, okay? But if I wanna make it like skinnier or fatter than my normal proportions, I hold the shift key down and this will release the proportion constraints. I can stretch it, I can um, compress it, different things like that. Um, now be careful, if you are using an older version of Photoshop, this is one of the differences. The older versions of Photoshop, uh, you had to hold shift down to constrain the proportions. 
and the default was to be able to make it skinny or fatter. So the newer versions, if you want to constrain proportions and not change the proportions of your image, you don't have to do anything. If you do, hold shift. In the older versions, it's reverse. So there we are, and we can move our little image about, put it where we want, la 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 la. Okay, so let's move down to our marquee tool. And this is gonna be our first selection tool. Now there are a lot of different ways to make selections. And again, selections is one of the largest uh, and most powerful functions of Photoshop. Um, and what selections do is again, they allow you to um, isolate part of the image and either copy it, cut it, move it, um, change something about it, edit it. So there's lots of different functions with the selection tool. So let's take a look at them. So I'm gonna click on our marquee tool and I'm gonna make a selection. So this is our rectangular marquee tool and what it does is it makes a rectangular selection. So I click and drag and I make a selection. Now I know a selection has been made because we get this little box and we get this sort of moving uh, black and white dots. A lot of people call them the marching ants because they look like little tiny ants marching along this line. Um, but until you have the marching ants, you have not made a selection. So now that I have made a selection, I can do a number of things. Uh, the first thing I can do is I can go back to my move tool and grab that selection and move it out. Okay, I'm going to just undo that by hitting uh, control Z and I'm going to go back to my selection. Okay, now the other thing I can do is I can make a copy of this. So I'm going to hit control C to make a copy and control V to paste it. Doesn't look like I did anything, but when I move back to the move tool, I get my little bounding box. And now when I move out the selection, you can see that it is a duplicate of that center of the flower and I haven't cut it out to move it, okay? In addition, when we make a selection, any um, alteration we make to the image will only apply to the selection. So this might be a good uh, time just to look at some of our image uh, adjustments. Now we're gonna go into this a lot more in our first uh, assignment, so I'm not going to do all of them, but I'm just going to show you uh, what it means to only apply to the selection. So let's just go to the brightness and contrast, and I bet you can figure out what that does. It controls the brightness and the contrast. Um, so here we have a selection made, and when I adjust the brightness, you can see that it only applies to the area within the selection. Now let's look at a few of the tool presets for our selection. Now we have up here some different boxes and this is going to um, allow us to change how we make selections or how we um, change our initial selection. So what is um, selected right now is new selection. That means anytime I use this tool it's just going to make a new selection based on however I click and drag out my box. If I click over here, this is my add to selection option. So let's see what this does. What this does is when I make another box, it's going to combine the two selections into one selection, okay? Now this one is gonna do the exact opposite. When I make another one, it's going to eat out of the selection and uh, take away that area that I create, um, altering the selection uh, accordingly. This one is, um, not, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever really used this one, but this one will create a selection based on the intersection of what you uh, draw out. So I have this current selection, and when I make an additional box, the only thing that is going to be selected is the intersection between these two boxes or the overlap of the two boxes. So that little area, that little tiny box that um, is the overlapping part, that's gonna be our selection. 
So um, most all of the selection tools will have these options to either make a new selection, add to it, subtract to it, or create an intersection. Now we also have a feather option. Now let me show you what this does. This will soften the edge of our selection. Um, and we typically do this when we are taking one element out of one image and adding it to another. What it will do, um, the feathering again will soften the images. It kind of, what I mean by soften, it kind of has this um, gradation of opacity. Um, and what it will do is it will allow um, new images that come into another image uh, to sit better into the image it's pasted into. So for in instance, if I taking another flower and want to put it in here, I'll soften the edges a little by feathering it um, and it will look more normal and natural. It won't have a hard, uh, harsh edge uh, which can make it look very obviously like it was pasted in there. So what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and uh, make a feather. I'm going to do a, a really hard feather um, so you can really see what it does. So let's feather this like 20 pixels um, and I'm going to make a selection. You see already the edges, it's not square anymore. They've rounded it off. So now what I'm going to do is take this out and you can see the softened edges. So it kind of has this gradation between um, opaque and translucent. So it, it fades out uh, gradually. It's not a harsh cut. And again, this can make things sort of sit in nicer. Um, also, uh, an extreme feathering like this, um, not, again, it'll look a little weird. You want to feather it maybe a little bit less for a natural look, but the extreme featherings uh, can kind of give it this very soft, ethereal look. So if that's sort of an aesthetic you're going for and you're an image, you want to utilize that, go right ahead. Okay, so underneath each tool, uh, we can access different varieties of that tool. And we do that by clicking and holding the mouse button down on that tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that with the rectangular marquee tool. And we see that what has popped up is a sort of drop down menu, um, which gives us a couple other options. It gives us an elliptical marquee tool, which <clears throat> you guessed it, makes um, round selections. Uh, if you want an exact circle, hold shift and it will create an exact circle. Let's go to new selection so I'm not creating an addition. Just to show you again, so that I'm holding shift and again, it's exactly circular. If you don't want something that's exactly circular, don't hold shift. Uh, the same is true for the rectangular marquee tool. If I want exactly a square, I just hold shift. Again, it's, it's rounded edges because I have it feathered, okay? Now we have other versions of a selection or other methods of creating a selection. As you can see, the rectangular and elliptical marquee tools are good for general selections. They're not very precise, um, but we have a number of other methods to make more precise uh, selections. We'll get into some of them now, um, but m we'll get into more later when we get into uh, the assignments. But here's our lasso tool. The lasso, um, as it mentioned in the thing, makes a freehand selection. So I click, hold the mouse button down, and go ahead and just draw out whatever selection I would like to make. Do, 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 boop. Um, there we are. So um, again, this is best used if you have some sort of stylus. Um, which will um, grant you the uh, ability to be a bit more precise with your hand movements. If you're using a mouse or a, a laptop, uh, laptop trackpad like I am, um, it doesn't allow for the most precise selections, but if you want just sort of something general, um, it's, it's pretty okay. A little quick selection, so on and so forth. And of course, we have all the same presets up here. We can feather it, we can add to it, subtract, so on and so forth. Uh, we have underneath here the polygon lasso tool, um, which is a sort of point and click, uh, and it creates a line. So let's make a selection. So every time I click, 
I'm making like a little anchor point. It's gonna just create a straight line in between every point that I click. So click, 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 click. And as you can see, um, it allows for a much more precise selection. Just double click to finish it. Um, and again, this is, uh, you can see I'm pretty close uh, on the edge. And of course, if you ever want to be more precise, utilize the zoom tool. A lot of students, I don't know why, but they don't utilize the zoom tool. Um, what's great about Photoshop and it allows for really great and close precision is the fact that we can zoom in really, really close. I can, I can zoom in so a pixel is huge. So I get this sort of, you know, pixel length um, uh, tolerance. And we do that, of course, we have the zoom tool jumping down to the end over here. Um, but what I like to use is just control positive to zoom in or control negative to zoom out. So I'll show you control positive, we'll zoom in. And then it makes it much easier for me to make incredibly precise selections you know, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm ex deciding basically what pixel I want to include um, by zooming in. Don't make your work harder. There's lots of tools in Photoshop that make things easier. The zoom is definitely one of them. Now, if I want to get out again, control negative will do that for me. And of course, I can use the zoom tool um, right here. And if I hold down, here so I'm on zoom out or zoom in or I can just do a certain percentage of size so on and so forth but again I like to use this keyboard shortcut okay so um, we're going to move down a little bit uh, this is another selection tool it's a little bit more complicated so there are two other ways to make selection actually there's there's a few more ways to make selections. There's quite a few, um, but we're not going to get into it because again, I just want to go over our very basic tools, but this is going to make, uh, they're just different ways to make selections. Um, and again, when we get into the different assignments, we are going to go ahead and take a closer look at things like the quick selection tool or the magic wand tool um, uh, and different selection methods, uh, like using the pen tool to create a path and so on and so forth. But again, just introduction, don't want to overload you. Um, and again, Photoshop can be very powerful and very complicated, but for a lot of the purposes that we're going to be using for, and just especially for the first couple assignments, um, we're going to keep it simple. So we're going to pass over that and go to our crop tool. Now the crop tool is pretty self-explanatory, right? We all know what it means to crop an image and it's showing us a lovely little preview of how to crop an image. So I've made my artboard a little bit too big. So let's go ahead and crop it. So we have a little bounding box here. As you can see the little squares on all around it. And all I need to do is grab one of the squares and bring it down. And it's gonna show me a little bit of a preview on how we're gonna crop it. There we go. And just to finish my crop, once I get it to the size that I want and everything I don't want is cropped out, I just hit enter. And it will apply. Okay. We're not gonna use the frame tool the frame tool, again, will uh, allow you to sort of center, and it's, it's sort of like a crop. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, the eyedropper tool will allow you to sample colors. It's pretty simple, so I just click on it, and anywhere I click is going to sample the color of that pixel, and we can see it down here. Now this is the Adobe Color Picker, and since we're on the eyedropper tool, let's take a look at um, how Adobe deals with color selection. So the color selected is here, and this is really Im important when we do things like text, because this is how we'll, uh, one of the ways that we can set um, color for text, or if we wanna use different um, like images, like not images, but um, 
objects like a like just a red square or a blue circle or something like that and we want to make that circle blue um, we're gonna set it here so let's take a quick look at the Adobe color picker and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna double click this guy right here now the Adobe color picker is gonna look the same throughout all of the Adobe software and over here on this little slidey bar we get the pure hues now colors are made up of a pure hue and then we also get a tonal or shade range of each hue um, this means that we get the pure hue up here in the upper right hand corner that's pure hue pure color la 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 now as we go along and move to the left we are adding white to this color so as you can see it gets lighter and lighter and lighter until we get all the way over here in the upper left hand corner where it is pure white okay moving down along the edge here we are adding black to the color so this would be the shade range of that color this would be the tint this is the shade and we are just mixing more and more black in with that color until we reach the bottom here and it is pure black. Now, all the other stuff in here is mixing that pure hue in with different grays. So up here, we're mixing the color with lighter grays. Down here, we're mixing the color with darker grays. So we get this really huge range of colors out of just sort of one hue. And of course, what we're gonna do is, you know, you can pick your hue and then pick your shade, tint, or tonal range, um, however you like. Now, all this stuff, all this jazz down here is how to identify this color. And it gives you lots of different um, ways of doing that. Um, so it gives you, uh, down here, here's the RGB code. So not all of these are necessary. They're really necessary in groups. So here we have um, uh, the H, which is it's, it's specific to the sort of color wheel and um, tonal range uh, where it can be found. Uh, here's the RGB value. It's how much red, green, and blue um, are used to produce this color down here. So this is sort of screen calibrated. So the RGB value would be enough to reproduce this color. Down here is the hex code, um, which is used in websites. So when we specify colors in websites using HTML, um, we go ahead and uh, use this number to specify that color. And they all have their own codes as well as their own um, RGB uh, makeup. We also have down here the CMYK. Again, these values will be used to represent um, that color. So it's also showing you the makeup based on the CMYK values. So this color that we have right now is 66% cyan, 85% magenta, 38% uh, 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 yellow, and 26% black. And each one of those is based on 100% value of that um, color. Uh, so you might be wondering why they're not adding up to 100%. Uh, it's because each one is, you can have a sliding value from 0 to uh, 100. Um, okay, so that is our color picker. And we also have a shortcut to it here. So here's a little shortcut value for it, so on and so forth. So if you don't want to go through that whole thing, you don't really care about your RGBs or your hex codes or whatever else, you can just go to the color pane. So this is a nice example of a lot of sort of the repetition that we see in Photoshop, which can at first seem pretty overwhelming. Um, but again, it's a lot of the same stuff in just multiple places. And if, again, so this is our first pane that we're looking at, the color pane. Um, and if it is not there for any reason, you can go ahead and go to your window and make sure it is popped up there. Okay, cool. So uh, the healing brush and spot healing brush is used basically to do, to do that, to um, uh, fix this. Uh, little patterns it will recognize anomalies in a color and pixel pattern and work to eliminate it it's pr 
pretty magical. Um, and we're gonna use that a lot in our retouching, so I wanna move on from here. Next we have the brush tool. And the brush tool basically works like a virtual um, paintbrush. So let's go ahead and just take a, take a quick look at our, um, let's zoom in to uh, our brush. So here's our brush tool and let's look at the brush presets up here. Um, well, we don't have any loaded, so let's see what we can work with. I gotta go over here. So um, there's like brush libraries if you want something like super special, like you need want something to look like, um, I don't know, something very specific. There's already a lot down here. So just generally, you're gonna have a size. You can have it really big or you can have it really small. And the hardness is like a feathering. This is the feathering for um, the actual brush. So let me show you kind of what it will look like. Oops. Get on layer one. So it's a huge brush, and I'm just gonna double check, what, uh, and I have 0% hardness. So it is very soft. It almost looks like a like an airbrush. Now let's, just for contrast, bump that up to 100% hardness. No softness around the edge, okay? Now in addition to that, let's make this a little bit smaller. Uh, th that's our basic general. It's also saving everything I do, so if you want to go back and use a brush. Uh, but there's like some neat stuff that you can use that will simulate the textures of different medium. Um, so let's see something fun. I don't know. Uh, here, this looks like, what do, what do they call this? The charcoal pencil. So if you want it to look like a charcoal pencil. La la la. We can make it look like a charcoal pencil. Um, let's play, you know, feel free to click through all this stuff and have fun with it. That's like really how you learn. What I would love for all you guys to do is just to open up Photoshop and, and mess around with it, press all the buttons, get a picture in there, like before you start, because it gets you a little bit more familiar with it. And um, it's fun to just sort of play around and, and, and see what it has. So it has a, like a spatter brush. Okay, whoa. Um, <laughs> let's go down to something a little bit more normal and we'll go on to the other tool preset. So let's just go maybe nice hard pencil. Okay, so um, let's go back to just a normal general brushes. Uh, we, there should be some calligraphy in here too. It used to be, I don't know. You can probably download it. Do, do a hard round and make it a little bit bigger. And I'm just gonna hardness about right there. Okay, so there we are. So um, let's look at some of these other ones here. So again, we have, um, you can do different things with your uh, a brush here. So if it's not exactly paint, um, if say you want to lighten it, So we're, we're basically, what I'm doing is I'm lightening the image. It's kind of hard to see. Now there's other tools that um, use this um, and we'll get down to them in a minute. And especially we'll get into them in, um, when we do the retouch. Uh, I just typically, if I'm using the brush tool, I use normal. Um, but again, play around with it because they all do you know something a little bit different. Um, and again, so if you want to just paint normally, use normal. Um, if you want to change the color or brightness or darkness of specific areas, you can use the brush tool to do that. Just go ahead and change the mode. Okay, there's other ways to do this as well. So again, um, don't get confused. Now the opacity over here, it's at 100%. You can see as I've been using the brush that um, I can't see anything underneath. And that's because it's at 100% opacity. But if you want a more layered look and you don't want to lose what's going on underneath, you can always lower the opacity. And then we can create our brush. And as you can see, we're not losing the detail underneath. And of course, uh, the percentage of opacity, 100% is completely not see-through. Zero is, you know, you can't even see it. 
um, and everywhere in between. So if I want it a little bit thicker, or if I want it a little bit lighter, so on and so forth. Uh, the flow is really important for sort of the airbrush and will sort of um, uh, govern the power uh, of it. Uh, don't really worry too much about this. Uh, the angle, again, is, is more important when you're using like calligraphy brushes and things like that, which we're not gonna be using. Um, okay, the clone stamp um, will go ahead and it's, it, it will take certain parts of the image and replicate it um, using a sort of brush tool like uh, function. Um, again, this is a little bit more complicated and we're gonna get into this a lot more when we do retouches. Um, history brush, again, um, will restore things to an earlier state. Uh, what I tend to like to use too is the history. So you only get so many undos with Photoshop. So if you hit Control Z, uh, you only get a couple steps to go back. But if you open up your history pane here, you can go by step by step and actually toggle in between it. So you can see what the image looks like at earlier states. So I can go all the way back to when I open this up, which is absolutely nothing. And I can basically scroll through all of the different changes that I made, see all the different steps, and go back to earlier versions. So if I don't want all this scribble scrabble, um, I can, when did I use this smudge tool? I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, uh, I can go ahead and use the history um, pane to use that. I really like to use the history pane. Um, again, it's, it's better than using just um, undo. And you can also really see the differences that you made um, going through the uh, work process. Eraser tool um, works like an eraser. It'll just simply erase um, your image. It works like the brush tool. As you can see, there's a lot of the same um, brush presets here. Um, again, they work all the same like the brush presets and it will just erase away straight down to the artboard. The gradient tool makes gradients for shapes and different images. We're not going to be using the gradient tool in Photoshop, but we are going to be using the gradient tool in Illustrator. So uh, they work fairly um, similar, uh, similarly. So, um, you know, if you're interested in using the gradient tool and how it works, I would just Google it for now. <laughs> uh, or you'll have to wait till we get to Illustrator. Uh, the smudge tool. And there's, again, each one of these has subsets that I'm not going into now. Again, this is just supposed to be an overview. Uh, the smudge tool, whoa, <laughs> uh, has my brush there. Uh, again, it has presets like a brush. Um, it doesn't paint anything then, though. What it does is it takes pixels and treats it like it was like maybe like a pastel or like a charcoal, and you're smudging it with your finger. So, oh, how did I get back to the brush? Sorry about that. Smudge tool. But I want it to be smudge. Okay, then I'm going to set it here. I don't want it so big. There. So it's smudging the image, basically blurring it, muddying it up. Um, it can be good for like areas of, of creating softness and things like that. Um, the strength here, so how much it smudges, so let's like boost it up. It does a lot of smudging. Um, if we go down a bit, it doesn't smudge it barely anything. It's hard to see. Um, at low level, if you want to just do a little bit of softening, so softening and edging, um, it can be really good for that. Under here, we also have its uh, counterparts, the sharpen tool. So instead of softening, that would um, sharpen it. So it sharpens the edges, makes them more harsh. And we also have the blur tool. And the blur will just simply blur. So as you can see, we really were able to pull color in using the smudge uh, tool. Blur is just going to blur an area, make it soft like that. Now here we have the uh, dodge tool. Um, 
And just like the brush had those different modes where you could lighten and darken, uh, the dodge tool does that too. So the dodge tool will go ahead um, and right now is sort of lightening things up. It was a pretty pretty subtle. Um, I'm only working on the midtone, so let's work on the shadows. And you can really see it lighten up as we do that. Underneath there, we also have the burn tool, and that's its counterpart. So the dodge tool lightens, the burn tool darkens. The last one in there is the sponge tool. Now the sponge tool will either desaturate or saturate, depending on the mode up here. And again, all of these have a, you can utilize them with a sort of brush tool that has the same presets as the brush. So you can, um, the style, the shape, the feathering, so you can see that saturating the image. Let's just click on over to desaturate and it takes the color away. Okay, pen tool, um, we're gonna use this as an alternate way of making really precise selections. Um, I'm not gonna get into it right now because again, we're gonna utilize that a lot later, um, but that's what it does. And we're gonna be using the pen tool primarily in Illustrator. So you'll get to know the pen tool very well by the end of this semester. Uh, text tool, text tool makes text. Pretty simple. Um, I can set them there. It gives you a little bit of a preview based on the uh, font you have selected. So here you have all the preset samples and you can see it changing, so you can sort of see what it will look like. And there's quite a few different um, fonts available just as standard in Photoshop. If there's something really special that you want, you can usually download it. But this should be enough for you. Whoa, whoa. Ah. Okay, okay, okay. Ah. Um, let me just go ahead and uh, lorem ipsa, it's, it's just, it's just a placement text and you can write what you want. However you want. Um, you get a little eye bar so you can select your text if you want to make further adjustments. Here we can make adjustments here. The only option for this um, this specific font is regular. Sometimes you get bold, so on and so forth. We can also um, go here and sort of change a little bit of, of what it looks like, little alterations. And this is, of course, the font size. So if we want it smaller, we can make it smaller. If we want it bigger, we can make it even bigger. Um, and then, of course, we have, if you are using a lot of text, this is probably not going to be something that we utilize a lot because we're not, we'll use text, but we're not gonna be writing novels or pamphlets or handouts or anything like that. Um, but again, it's our paragraph uh, alignment, which you see in using Word, it's, it's the same thing. This would be align left, which will, um, if I have it selected, align everything to the left. Um, if I select this now and align it to the right, it will align everything to the right and center will center it like so, yeah. Here's my uh, font text. So again, we double click that and we get our color picker. So let's say I want red, get red text. Um, we also have some text effects. Play around with it. It'll make your text do fun things like arch or wave like a flag. Um, and each one will have its own little presets right below here that will affect how it stretches or warps your text. So um, this adjusts how much it bends or what direction it bends. Uh, this will make it smaller on one end. Same with this. Woo! So, you know, play around with it. There's lots of different ways to adjust your text. And then of course you can move text with your move tool, just like anything else. You can also scale it with your move tool. Oops. So let's take and scale. So on and so forth. The arrow tools are um, 
used in conjunction with the pen tool, so I'm going to go ahead and hold off on that. Now these are basically just for making shapes. If I want to make a rectangle, let's say I want to make a rectangle. I click and drag, and it's going to ask, you know, what exactly do you want your rectangle to look like? First, how exactly big do you want it? And so it's going uh, right now, uh, it's showing me that this um, rectangle is 183 by 102 pixels. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, if you don't like to measure in pixels, you can change in uh, the preferences. And the preferences are hiding all the way at the bottom of the edit menu. And here you can change lots of different things um, to your preference. So here, unit and rulers. And depending on what you're working with, you can set your units. So here the rulers are in inches, as you can see that. Um, you can set your rulers to in inches, uh, so on and so forth. Um, all the different preferences that you can sort of change, uh, what you like to show, if you, if you want to click off the tool tips and different things like that, you can do it here. Um, so again, once you get a little bit more familiar with Photoshop and you say, oh, I'd, I'd be really great if this happened or that happened or whatever else, um, the color of your guides, I don't know what cyan for my grid guide or for my grid color or whatever else, um, you can do it here. In any case, let's go back to our rectangle. Let's say this is perfectly fine. Now they're giving me two options for color. Um, right now I have a black border and you can see that I have a black border for my uh, rectangle. Okay, This with the red line indicates a invisible fill. So that's why I can see my image um, through my rectangle. Now if I want this to be a color, I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And I get some recently used colors uh, from my swatch panel or I can go to my color picker here and pick a nice color from there, hit OK, and I get that color. Okay, So that's how we make basic colored shapes in Photoshop. Now I can also adjust um, the size of my border, making it fatter or thicker or however I like it. Um, I can also get rid of my border by clicking on the, the border icon and applying that invisible fill. Okay. We have a few other options here, but don't worry about them. These should look familiar to you. So if you do want to create other shapes that sort of uh, more complex shapes, go ahead. And of course, underneath here, if you don't want to make a square, you want to make other different types of shapes, they're right here. Okay, we're almost to the end of the tools. So uh, take a deep breather because we're almost to the end. We just got to get through the rest. Really one more tool, which is our hand tool. The hand tool pretty much um, lets you guide the image around and it is most utilized when you are super, super zoomed in and you want to move out. So if I want to, you know, I can of course use the scroll bar on either side of the work window to do so. But if you want a little bit more freedom in how you move, click and drag utilizing the hand tool. Pretty simple. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to my history and let's just sort of clean this out a little bit. And the last thing I really want to get through today um, is the layers. So let's go back a bunch to something a little bit. So um, I'm going to open up my layers panel, which is right over here. Now, if it's not right over here, just like with anything else that you're having trouble finding, go to window and find it there. Okay. So how Photoshop works and, and one of the ways that it works really nicely is it allows us to isolate different um, parts of our image by utilizing layers. So right now I only really have one layer, which is my flower. Okay, but let's go ahead. I'm going to go back to my rectangular marquee tool 
and then I'm going to go ahead and make a selection and I'm going to copy it by hitting Control C and then I'm going to paste it. Now watch that layer window and see what happens. Okay, I got a new layer. Uh, and what it did is it pasted this selection onto a new layer. Okay, now this is very helpful when it comes to working with Photoshop and we're going to be using different layers um, in different respects. But um, if everything was on one layer, it gets very complicated, gets very jumbled, and it gets kind of unworkable. So what Adobe did is it allowed for this layer system, and the layer system allows us to look, again, at certain parts of our image individually. So in our layer window, I can have a few options. So I see layer two. And layer two is just my selection. And if I wasn't sure about that, I can go ahead and toggle the visibility of each layer on and off individually. So let's toggle layer one off. And now I can see just layer two, just my selection and vice versa. I can toggle the visibility of layer two on and off, just like that. Now layers will appear in order, basically on top of each other. So really imagine each layer like, like physically layered on top of each other. So I can see layer two because it's on top of layer one. But if I were to click and drag layer one on top of layer two, I can no longer see it, okay? So if you can't see something, that might be the issue make sure that no other layer is on top of it, blocking your view of that part of the image, okay? Um, I can do different things, like I can create a um, new layer down here by creating a new layer. So now I have layer three, and again, I can click and drag my layers depending on how I want them to layer on top of other elements of my image. Now, one thing that you might run across, so let's take this example. I'm on layer three and I have layer three selected and I can see that. So typically people will work in Photoshop and they will almost always have their layer window open. And this is why, because they'll develop different di layers, many, sometimes many, many different layers. And I wanna make a selection. So let's make a selection. Okay, there's my selection. Now I'm gonna copy. Oh no, it could not complete the copy because the selected area is empty. What does that mean? It's not empty, I see stuff in it. Well, Photoshop sees it as empty because there's nothing on layer three. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so let's go to layer two. Now my selection, if I remember layer two is just, okay, okay. This is just layer two, okay? So if I'm on layer two and I make a selection all the way over here, remember there's nothing over there. So if I make a copy, I'm gonna get that same error. So now I'm gonna make it over here and it's only gonna copy what's on layer two. So let's copy it. I'm gonna toggle this off and then I'm going to paste. So you can see it didn't copy anything from layer one because I wasn't on layer one. I'm on layer two. Okay, um, same as if I want to copy from layer one, I want something from this original image, I have to make sure that that layer is selected before I make my selection onto that image. Now, if we have some layers we don't need or don't want, you can also drag, click and drag them to the little trash can and then they will go away. Okay, now you can also, um, let me just make another quick selection and paste it on here. Copy, paste, again, so now we have a new layer too. Um, I can also adjust the opacity of each layer. So um, again, it's very soft around here. Actually, let's make this a little less soft of a selection. So you, the, the next thing I show you will make it a little bit easier to see. So I'm gonna reduce the feathering down to zero. So it's a nice hard selection and okay, fantastic. Let's move it out. So we have this sort of duplicate here. There's my very hard selection, as you can see right there. 
Now what I'm gonna do is I can also adjust the opacity of the entire layer. Um, and this will make the layer itself become see-through. So let's go ahead and drop the opacity of layer two down to about 40%. Now it's see-through. I can see the bottom layer underneath it. Okay, and we can do this to all objects and layers too. I didn't uh, forgot to mention that with my um, rectangle tool, but we can also adjust the um, opacity of uh, my rectangle. So let's just make it a color so I can show you that. Okay. And then see the shape itself is its own layer. So I can adjust the opacity of that layer and make my rectangle see-through. Mm, neat, right? So we have lots of different opportunities and this again was meant to be just the sort of introductory um, lesson to go over the basic tools. So, um, and even such, we can do so much with just these basic tools. So have fun, play around with these tools, um, get a little bit more familiar with it, just sort of look at it, see how they work it, just get, get familiar with it. And um, we'll come back and start our first assignment in the next lesson, which will be just sort of basic uh, photo retouching. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye.